You are listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Body Banter. I'm Claudia Krebs, joining you from Vancouver on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. And with me here is my uh, co-host, uh, Shagan Oyedeli. Hi, everyone. I'm Shagun Oyedeli here, calling in from Kelowna in the unceded territories of the Silks Okanagan nation. And we have two wonderful guests today, um, Jamie Chapman. Hello, um, my name's Dr. Jamie Chapman. I'm from the University of Tasmania from Australia. Um, I'm on the uh, lands of the Palawa people uh, here in Tasmania. Welcome, Jamie. And we have Jenna from UBC. Yeah, nice to be here. I'm Dr. Jenna Usbridge. Um, I'm also in the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples. Welcome, everyone. We are here to talk about the building blocks of anatomy, cells and tissues. And we're so thrilled to have both of you here representing cells and tissues. And um, Jamie, I'm going to start with you because you have this lovely relationship to tissues and to histology. Your way of talking about histology and what you see under the microfo- microphone microscope um, is poetic. Your love for what you do is clear in every word. Tell us about your love for histology and tissues. Thanks. Um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to explain. I think uh, perhaps I, you know, growing up, I, I, came from a not very religious family. So um, I was, I suppose, looking for an understanding about, I guess, you know, where we come from. And so I, I've, as I, as I, you know, went and did biology at high school and then moved to university, I found almost like a purpose um, in the science behind, you know, structure and function. And so I found the passion there, you know, it made, it made sense to me, like a cell made sense to me, the tissues that made up our organs made sense to me. And then putting it into an evolutionary context really made sense to me as well. Um, so I think I'm someone who, who loves art as well. Um, but doesn't have a very, artistic <laughs> way to express myself so I tend to use the the beauty of the stains and the images that I can create using histology as an uh, I suppose an artistic expression of myself as well so I see beauty in the cells the tissues um just the, and then thinking about the time that went into the development of of these cells and tissues and and how they've become arranged over time so so for example I'll just take an example that that I always think about there's um there's a slide that I saw there's a virtual slide that I saw of skin and it'd been stained specifically to highlight the elastic fibers in skin. And we have little muscles attached to our hairs called erectopili muscles. And just hanging off these little erectopili muscles in this section I had was connective tissue and elastic fibers anchoring these um, small muscles that erect our hair. And they just that level of detail, that level of specialization of, of the structure of the tissue just 
blew my mind. And I, and I often sort of, every time I go to a new section, I often feel like an explorer, um, or, you know, an astronomer sort of looking at the universe and looking at what makes up the universe. And every time I look at a section, I find something new, or if it's not new, then, you know, I'm seeing it in a different context and, you know, helps me appreciate, you know, just, just how we are structured. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think, you know, it gives me a sense of identity and purpose and, you know, my, my understanding of where we fit in evolution. Um, you know, that, you know, we are a, a branch of, you know, the third chimpanzee is, um, Jared Diamond put it. Um, so I don't feel separate from nature. I certainly feel part of nature because of that. And I don't know if that's a bit weird to say. That is not weird at all. And I would say you have found your artistic expression in exactly this. That again was so poetic, what you just had to say, putting um, yourself into the tradition of evolution of, of life on this planet and also the tradition of the craftsmanship that goes into making histological slides, the different stains. Uh, sort of the techniques and the artistry really that went into that. So thank you for that. That's um, what a beautiful introduction to this topic. Yeah, Jamie, that, that was really fascinating um, and very poetic. But turning to you, Jenna, um, you have an uh, engineering background. And so I'm wondering uh, how you relate to cells um, or how you approach cells from an engineering perspective. What, what what do they mean to you uh, with that lens? Yeah, thanks for that question. And I think my answer is going to be a lot less poetic uh, than Jamie's, but um, equally, I think, interesting. Um, so uh, how we can look at cells from an engineering standpoint, um, I think cells are basically the original engineer, original builder. Um, they can create their whole environment, basically. They create tissues, they create organs, they allow us to survive and thrive. Um, so it's pretty interesting when you get down to that small level, you see that how much cells are capable of. And from a very practical standpoint, if we can control what cells can do, if we can control the output then we can make tissues, we can build organs, we can do lots of interesting, cool things. And I think um, from a biomedical engineering standpoint, this focus on therapy and medicine, and um, uh, we have the potential to, if we have the potential to grow tissues and organs, then we might not need to worry about an organ shortage for donation and things like that. So I think there's just huge potential to tap into the power of the cell. Uh, there's still so much we don't understand about how cells work. And that Jamie was talking about that already. And so that's already interesting. But I guess we can also make use of even if we don't know everything about the cell, we know that they can make make tissue. So if we can create the right environment, even if we don't know everything that's in that black box, um, there's a lot of potential there. That's so wonderful, Jenna. And talking about poetic, that's that's um, that's another layer of um, of poetry and and uh, how everything uh, comes back to the original builders. Uh, I like that analogy. Um, what do you think, Claudia? I love the idea of the cell being the original engineer. That's so beautiful. I can see like Bob the Builder as like inside every cell now. This is going to be my new visual as I look at cells. Speaking of visualizing cells, we had this conversation, Jenna, when, um, you know, when we were teaching together, um, how we always look at cells as a flat thing, right? Like when we look at diagrams of cells and when we look at even, you know, um, cells under the microscope. And then you made me realize that, of course, a cell is three-dimensional. Tell us more about that, because that is such an eye-opening realization, because, of course, it's three-dimensional. How could it not be? And how have I been looking at cells as a two-dimensional flat thing all my life? Tell me more. Yeah, I think um, it is true that in some parts of our body, we have cells that line surfaces. So they 
are fairly flat, but for the majority of cells, they're existing inside a material. So the three-dimensional environment becomes really important. So cells can exist in many different shapes. If they're inside a material, they're usually, um, depending on how confined that material is, they would be spread out in some fashion. So you can't see this because it's a podcast, so I should describe it. Um, but you sort of imagine uh, if a cell is like your hand, um, there are usually a lot of processes, um, parts that come off the, of the cell that help it attach to materials. Um, so the processes would be like your fingers and the main body would be like the palm of your hand. So if you imagine these star shapes uh, in, in certain tissues that, kind of is what some cells might look like in different tissues, as opposed to just a flat oval that we usually see depicted in, in images um, of cells. And I mean that, I think that probably we'll, we'll probably throw to Jamie, I'm, I'm guessing, because he does a lot of histology and uh, that's what you see in those images. But um, it's really interesting when you start to image things in using technologies that allow you to see the three dimensions that you can start to see those unique different shapes. And it depends on the type of cell and the type of material. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I find that really fascinating. And also the images can be pretty beautiful as well. Jamie, over to you. Yeah. So it's certainly as students explore histology for the first time, one of the things that is really important that they recognise is that they're looking at a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional structure. So sometimes that becomes really important to understand with the interpretation. So, for example, if you're looking at a, a finger-like projection of an intestinal villus, for example, not every section is going to be, the, the villi don't all line up like soldiers. Um, so they're all going to be at different levels. And so you're going to have some which are completely sort of nice longitudinal sections, so sort of like long fingers. Others are going to be just short fingers because we've sort of just cut the, them obliquely and so on. So having an appreciation of that three-dimensional structure is is really important. I always, um, so I, I, uh, I did my PhD on reproductive biology and, and um, so, you know, looked at sperm, live sperm under the microscope as well. And I always think about them. And when I explain to students about how um, a flagellum works or, or a cilium works, you know, it's, it's a rotation. So it's like a whip like motion. But most of the time when we see sperm, we always think of them just swimming forwards. But of course, that's because <laughs> they're trapped underneath a cover slip of glass. Um, so they can only swim in that plane. But if we saw them in, in solution, they would sp swim in a spiral pattern because that's the way the flagellum works. And, um, and, and the cilium, for example, creates that sort of whip-like motion rather than just a waving back and forth. Um, so yeah, it's, um, I, I, I do like that, um, idea of, we we trap things under glass <laughs> and we don't always get an appreciation of that three-dimensional structure. Amy, it's, this makes me think of something I've been thinking about a lot, which is how we, um, for the past 100 years or so, have learned to interact with the world through a two-dimensional screen ever since the advent of um, cinema, really. Um, we are experiencing stories and um uh, reality in, in many ways, right? Like pictures in two dimensions, but our brains and our entire body is are set out to understand the world in three dimensions. Um, and that I think is particularly challenging when we're looking at histology and cell biology, because all of those ways of looking at the body have only been possible in this two dimensional world kind of trapped underneath the cover glass um, how do you overcome that? I think it it does come with explanation. Um, and again, we, we with histology, um, we have what are called artifacts, and and artifacts are errors introduced uh, into an image or our section um, when we process for microscopy. And I suppose looking at a three-dimensional structure in two dimensions is almost like an artifact. And so we actually need to appreciate that we are looking at something which isn't a perfect representation of the three-dimensional tissue, but an approximation of it. And, um, and it's funny, you know, we, we, 
with the way we process um, cells and tissues for microscopy, uh, we all introduce the same errors. And so we even label features of cells and tissues which are actually not real. So, for example, um, underneath an epithelium is a structure called a basal lamina. And a basal lamina has two layers. It has what's called a lamina lucida, uh, sort of a translucent layer, and a lamina densa. And that's actually artifact. There's really no space there. The lamina lucida, that white space, is actually just because things shrink when we process from microscopy. And so, but we've all accepted it. And in the skin, we have a layer called the stratum spinosum. Uh, That's a spiny layer. It means spiny layer. And it's the reason it's spiny is because cells shrink when we process and they have these processes, these cellular processes, which remain because of these very strong cell junctions. And again, it's only there because we, we process in the same way. So we're really identifying errors and naming up errors, even though they don't actually naturally exist within the, the real three dimensional structure. Thanks for that, Jamie. And, and that will take me to Jenna to ask um, about new technologies and new ways of visualizing as well as culturing cells in 3D. Uh, so perhaps making them more realistic. Uh, do you want to share some of those techniques with us? Yeah, for sure. So talk about uh, errors. Um, most of our body is not hard plastic. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, um, it's made up of tissues that have a variety of different stiffnesses or softness. Um, so just like the cells wouldn't behave normally um, on, you know, different types of stiffness materials, we, we shouldn't think that culturing them on flat tissue culture plastic is kind of the most representative way to culture these cells. But yet for many, many years, that's the primary way that we cultured cells in the lab to then use in different experiments. Um, What that does to the cell behavior is a little bit unclear. So in some situations, it might be fine. In some situations, you put cells that were in a 3D environment in the body outside of the body on a hard plastic dish, you can't really predict um, what changes that has on cell behavior. So by changing the culture conditions, by trying to mimic the softness or stiffness, um, sort of more of the material properties of the natural tissue that the cells would be coming from, um, we can imagine that that might be more representative of how those cells would be like inside the body. And there's evidence to show that it is. Um, and at very least, it, there's evidence to show that it impacts how cells behave. So if we think of stem cells as an example, um, you change the stiffness of the culture surface that a stem cell is sitting on, that will affect their ability to differentiate. That might drive differentiation of those cells, so specialization of those cells to a specific uh, cell type. Um, And then you think of the next layer, well, we're talking about culturing on a 2D surface, even if it's a soft material. Now think about embedding that cell into that soft material and you get to another layer of of perhaps something that's more like what's happening in the body. So there are all these methods that you can choose to use for culturing cells, and that might get you a little bit closer to what those cells would be like inside the body. And you also asked me about uh, visualizing uh, these cells in in 3D. So that comes down uh, a little bit to sort of the advances in microscopy that have come about. Um, And so we have a lot of great uh, microscopes that allow us to see cells in that uh, two-dimensional plane um, that relies on us uh, being able to look at a very thin uh, layer of either cells on a surface or the thin slice of tissue like Jamie would be uh, doing with histology. Um, If we have the ability to look at cells within a 3D material and kind of optically do that uh, sectioning, those thin slices, uh, that enables us to kind of recapture or reconstitute that image into a three-dimensional image by taking kind of these options optical sections. Um, So that's a technique called confocal microscopy that allows us to see um, cells in 3D. And there are other types of microscopy uh, options for you to to visualize in 3D, but that's just 
uh, one of the the main ones that's used. That's so cool. And oh, sorry, Shagan, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to just say that it, I relate in some way because I remember from my own doctoral work. Uh, culturing on uh, matrigel and fibronectin and all of these other uh, extracellular matrix uh, um, surfaces that r- tries to recreate that three dimensional um, surfaces on which on which cells would be uh, would be in the natural environment. So um, I can relate to to that <laughs> in some way. But go ahead, Claudia. You are going to. Uh, take that well, I was going to go all poetic again, because what you were telling me, Jenna, was um, our environment matters, right? Like our cells are going to adapt to the environment that they're in. You change the the culture medium, you change the surface that the cells are grown on, or in the body, you change the extracellular matrix and the cell behaves completely differently. Um, I find that really fascinating. And when we think about um, our tissues and our organs in health and disease, um, oftentimes in disease states, there is a change in the extracellular matrix. There's a change in the environment. Even something as simple as a change in pH can completely change uh, the behavior of those cells. Um, and, you know, when we, we look at the body in a more holistic way, um, you know, kind of we zoom in on the cell, but then when we zoom out on the entire body again and the environments that these cells find themselves in, um, anyway, I find it's it's very poetic to to think about the environment and how it influences things. So I'm sure you guys have favorites. I know you're not supposed to, but we all have our favorites. So Jamie, what's your favorite cell? That's a difficult one because um, I I did my PhD on oocytes, uh, which are of course the egg cells uh, within the ovary, and so I spent a lot of time because uh, I I did my PhD on marsupial oocytes, and so I spent a lot of time looking down, dissecting microscopes, and pricking out oocytes from large follicles and things, and so I would see spheres everywhere, perfect spheres, because an oocyte is a perfect sphere with perfect spherical um, membranes outside of it, and so I would see them everywhere outside as well, um, and I so I spent a long time looking at those. Um, the ones which I sort of enjoy talking about to students, um, I think an osteoclast, um, because they're these massive cells, they're sort of fusions of, of up to 30 cells or so. And so they're multinucleated. They, they sit on the surface of bone. They have this fuzzy border, which, um, makes them look like they've got a, you know, a little bit like Dr. Zoidberg from, um, uh, from the cartoons and he sits on the surface and, and spits out acid and enzymes and just sort of eats the surface. And, um, certainly I can relate very much to eating lots of things myself. So, um, I, I'm sort of like the osteoclast of the human environment. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I love, I've loved talking about osteoclasts and, um, and pointing them out. They're visually interesting because they have multi, multiple nuclei and they're big pink cells and, um, they sit on on the surface of bone. That is so amazing. And your love for both oocytes and osteoclasts is, is just an amazing spectrum. I remember when, um, you know, you, I have kids and um, of course I, I got them books about um, reproduction and sex age appropriate to, you know, where they were at. And my daughter was, I'd say six or something. We were looking through the book together and, you know, there was this big oocyte and this little sperm and I explained what was happening. And then she looks at me, she's like, we're the oocyte. I'm like, yeah, that's right. She's like, we're so much bigger. I'm like, yes, we are. (laughs) So I think you you have another person there who was uh, really appreciative of the oocyte. And for the osteoclasts, I cannot help but think of the Tim Tams that you gave me and turned me into a Tim Tam osteoclast right then and there. So thank you. Jenna, how about you? What's your favorite cell? Um, This is definitely a a (laughs) self-serving answer, I guess. Um, And it comes down to, uh, so Jamie's talking about for his doctoral research, also a cell that I used in my doctoral research. So the mesenchymal stromal cell or mesenchymal stem cell, it has multiple different names. It's actually a 
a population of probably a quite heterogeneous mixture of, of cells, but they're um, able to differentiate into more connective tissue types. Um, and they're very easy to grow. <laughs> uh, so I liked using them because they had they had such potential, um, but they also um, were fairly easy as in terms of stem cells, as far as stem cells go, because stem cells can be kind of finicky to culture, but the MSCs are very easy, easy going out of that bunch. Um, so that's what I would pick. I like that the chill stem cell. I chill. always imagine stem cells to be a little bit anxious because they have so many choices to make. And yeah. How do you make those choices? But that MSC cell seems chill. I like that. That's yeah. awesome. Um, so Jenna, if you've got a favorite cell, what's your least favorite cell? Least favorite cell? Um, I'd have to say uh, mold, <laughs> you know, uh, definitely uh Fungus and cell culture doesn't mix. Um, I, I did a lot of work in my PhD where I, I tried my best to keep the culture sterile, but there was only so much I could do when I was interfacing with different types of um, pieces of equipment. There would be some openings sometimes, and, and if there was any fungus, it was uh, toast. <laughs> so it would ruin my experiment. So I don't really like those. I and think, I think that extends to regular life too. Like, when is mold good? I, have, I mean, penicillin. Brown cheese, right? it's not too bad. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> penicillin, yeah. Okay, there you go. Context is important, I guess. <laughs> oh, my God. But anybody who's ever done a cell culture just had an anxiety attack with you talking about mold and yeast in their yeah. cell culture because it's the worst thing ever. Um, Jamie, what about you? What's your least favorite cell? I can't look. Well, to be honest, I can't say I do have a least favorite cell. Um, I was other kind than... of thinking you'd answer that. I was kind of expecting you to <laughs> love them all. <laughs> yeah. um, other than, of course, cancer cells. You know, um, you know, they cause such problems, and you know, take away our loved ones. And, and so, yeah, I'd probably just name cancer cells as general. Um, uh, as yeah, being I my think least favorite. Okay, I I hate cancer cells more than I hate yeast cells. Also, yeast cells are great for making bread and beer, so that does redeem them. Cancer cells have no redeeming qualities. Yeah, now I feel like, uh, my, how can I change my answer? Let's <laughs> 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 no, get that. Let's get it. Yeah, it seems like we do have a common enemy right now. <laughs> um, to go into from cell from the cellular la- level to a bigger uh, tissue layer uh, level. Um, and so I'm going to start with Jamie to say, uh, do you have any favorite tissues? Again, it's like asking me to choose my favorite child. Um, my favorite child is Aiden. Uh, anyway, anyway let's, <laughs> this podcast, they won't hear this podcast. Um, <laughs> I have three sons, so no, that's not true at all. Um, again, I don't really have a favorite tissue. Um, sort of aesthetically, what I really like to look at Um something like the epididymis, which has a lovely pseudo-stratified columnar epithelium. It's got these big, long stereocilia. And the reason I like it is that um, that the epithelium is a, just a regular height uh, all the way around. So it's just this beautiful, perfect sphere uh, when you cut them in cross-section and um, really tall cells. Um, these big prominent sort of weird haircuts of of stereo cilia on their their top. So I do like, um, I suppose, epididymal epithelial tissue. I'm just saying, wow, wow, wow! You do have uh, a poetic streak to you. <laughs> I love the, I love the epididymal haircut. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> um, and how about you, Jenna? Do you do you have any favorite tissue? Yeah, I think connective tissue just broadly uh, would probably be my favorite uh, just because it's, it comes in many different forms. Um, it's very supportive. <laughs> uh, what else to say about it? It's just, I mean, it's responsible for most of the structure that we have, all the structure that we have in our body. We wouldn't be the size or shape that we are without it. So I'd say that one. 
I just can I jump in? Do you mind? Um, connective tissue is, is one of those uh, tissues that's really underrated by students because, of course, without connective tissue, epithelium wouldn't get its blood supply. Um, muscle tissue couldn't contract against something, um, and nervous tissue wouldn't get to where it needs to get to in the, the peripheral body without connective tissue. So it's a very underrated uh, tissue. It it doesn't have the lovely appearance of epithelium, but in terms of structure and function, as um, Jenna said, you know, we couldn't function without it. I like that. It reminds me last year, one of our, um, one person that I was talking about with tissues, um, you know, she has no biology background. She was just looking at it and she said, you know, I looked into this epithelium thing you mentioned. They seem very needy. They have no blood supply on their own. They need the connective tissue for everything and they hang on to each other for dear life. <laughs> and I thought it was so funny too. Now I always imagine epithelium as this sort of bunch of very needy cells that just depend on each other and on the connective tissue that gets no glory. So thank you for that shout out. <laughs> So maybe if I relate this to students generally and to say, uh, Jamie, about what you do, uh, histology, obviously, cells are your passion. If you could tell students one thing or maybe like a takeaway uh, from your passion for cells, what would that be? How how would you uh, inspire students or, or tell them something about what you do? that you feel will make a difference for them? Oh, that's tricky. Um, Look, I think um, students, you know, we all have bodies, we all have anatomy. And I think if you keep relating it back to yourself, um, you know, you get a better understanding about what's going on in your own body. Um, so, like, I, I love explaining something like the menstrual cycle because it's just telling, you know, it's it's a lovely sequence of what's going on with the hormones in the body and, and the reflection in what happens to the organs and tissues uh, in response to those hormones. Um you know, I love a lovely pathway, you know, if you've got a nice feedback mechanism that happens in the body, um, because it's, it just makes sense. You know, you, there's no opinion about the structure of, of the body. It's, it's just what it is. And it, that's what I love about it. This, the, the simplicity of the complexity of the human body, you know, we, we get more and more understanding, you know, just this week I read a, a paper in Nature about um, the role of neutrophils, which is a type of white blood cell, and their role in um, helping repair connective tissues. They actually drag connective tissue fibres to the damaged area and help to initiate repair. And we're finding out more and more about, you know, the way cells function, you know, every year um, there's research going on. And, and so, you know, we're finding just get find that find that area that you you love and um and use that to drive drive your your passion for for understanding the way um the body is structured and and um moving forward i think you know maybe you have someone who who is sick because of a particular illness and you want to learn more about you know that disease and what cells and tissues are involved so find something that you can can latch onto and and I, I don't know, I think, you know, find the beauty in ourselves um, by by looking at structure and function. Thanks so much, Jamie. That that was really lovely. Um, I like the, your phrase, this the complexity in the simplicity, you know, or the simplicity in the complexity. They seem to just go side by side, which is really fascinating. How about you, Jenna? Any pearls of wisdom for students about what you do? Uh, yeah, I think so, at least. Um, I, I guess for the students that are unfamiliar with cells, um, and maybe not in a STEM field, uh, I would probably describe how you work with cells and how it's sort of like watering a plant. <laughs> um, they have basic, very basic needs um, from that standpoint. So they just need water and basically a protein slurry um, and some surface to grow on. Um, So taking care of them is fairly easy. 
Um, and so I think that maybe relates a little bit to Jamie's simplicity and the complexity. It's fairly simple in terms of their needs, um, but then they can perform very complex functions. And the more you dive in, the more you can dive in further and you can get really, really um, into niche areas of understanding specific pathways, specific proteins and how they are shaped. And um, you can get lost in all of those details or daunted by them, um, or you can kind of zone back out or zoom back out and look at just whole function. And maybe from a standpoint of, you know, how can we use these cells to make what we want? And we don't necessarily care again, like exactly how that happens, but we know what the input and output is. So I would say you can, you can look at cells and you can learn about them and you can work with them for very different purposes. And it doesn't all have to be to the level of extreme detail that someone doing their doctoral research would be uh, getting into to kind of appreciate them and understand them. Um, I'd also say that uh, sometimes stem cells get this controversial kind of association with them. And I think that comes down to a lot of uh, the prior use with embryonic stem cells um, and kind of concerns about uh, using embryos for that purpose. And uh, also want to mention that uh, there's induced pluripotent stem cells now that totally have almost that same capacity for uh, differentiation that an embryonic stem cell would have. Uh, and those are induced from adult cells. So you can take a skin cell and you can induce it to become a pluripotent stem cell, which is amazing and powerful and uh, just really fascinating. So I think some people might discount this area for fear of engaging in an area that uh, might be controversial. And I'd say that doesn't have to be like that. Thank you so much. And one thing among many, but one thing that shines through is how great both of you are in expressing yourselves and communicating your passions. And in fact, both of you, besides your love for cells and tissues and education, you're both also consummate science communicators. So, um, Jenna, you've just created a science communication course at UBC for the engineering um, department. Um, and, Jamie, you talk about science with high school students. So two different audiences and um, let's start maybe with the high school students and then take them up to university after that. Um, Jamie, how did that start? And, and what's the best thing about that? I, I think it's um, certainly from my experience, it's, it's when you expose the students to, to something and they, it just clicks in their, in their minds. You know, you, you just see that something happens in them that they go, wow, I've got a real interest in this and I didn't realise that, you know, this could be a pathway or that it was an interest in there. Um, so I do remember, for example, taking some students around and showing them the different microscopes that we have in our university and a student seeing uh, one of our researchers in neuroscience, um, they were using a fluorescence microscope and they were looking at some, some uh, astrocytes. And that from that time, that student said, I'm going to go into neuroscience and they just went forward and they ended up doing honours and PhD in neuroscience. And it was just from that exposure to seeing, you know, science in action. Um, so so the other ways I've been engaging is through anatomical body painting. So we've been using the idea that, you know, you can paint examples and you can actually see the joints move and the muscles move and, and things like that. And again, everyone has an anatomy. And so, um, they, you know, they may not think about it all the time. And um, so, you know, capturing their excitement about, you know, how their bodies work, I think has been uh, a lot of fun. And, and as I say, everyone's got an anatomy. So, you know, I think everyone probably should be interested in uh, understanding about, you know, how they work. Thanks, Jamie. I love you, that you keep on saying everybody has an anatomy. So how can you not be interested in it? I agree with you. Absolutely. Uh, Jenna, how about you? So this was a, a course for um, undergrads in engineering. Um, yeah, so um, it's a course for 
uh, graduate students actually, uh, and, yep. and they were uh, they're in STEM fields. So it's actually it can extend beyond uh, biomedical engineering. Although most of the students were biomedical engineers, um, but the purpose of the class is um, so that they get some training in science communication to diverse audiences. So it actually does have parallels to what Jamie's talking about is communicating to high school students as well. That's sort of a feature of. You know, they're an audience, they're an important audience. Um, we're not just uh, as uh, people who do research in, in STEM fields communicating only to other scientists. So it's really important to understand how we need to tailor tailor your message to the audience that you're speaking to. And that's not necessarily dumbing it down or talking down to the people that you're speaking to, but having a common language. I think that's the biggest thing is that the mistake that people make is assuming that everyone will understand their very technical language or maybe not even being aware that they're using technical jargon. And so um, being able to speak uh, about what you're working on in this common language that your audience would understand is a tricky thing to learn how to do. And you just need to practice it. Um, you need to see the eyes sort of glaze over and be like, well, okay, I lost them. Let's try a different uh, method. And, uh, and yeah, working in uh, speaking with high school students or, or kids, uh, that's a really quick way to see if your message is landing or not, because they will show you immediately <laughs> whether or not they understand what you're talking about. So yeah, I, I like to, uh, to get that message across to the grad students that I teach uh, is just, you know, you have to be aware of who you're speaking to and uh, try to get to that common language. That's so cool. And I remember when I was a baby undergrad and um, I would hide behind the big terms to um, mask the fact that I didn't know much. So I felt if I used big words, I would at least sound smart. Um, and hopefully nobody would notice that I didn't know much. Um, I think that's a common theme. Thank you, everyone, for nodding um, and, and, and sharing this moment with me. <laughs> um, so how did you overcome that, Jamie and Jenna? Because you're not doing that. You are obviously confident in your knowledge and you're able to use your hand to explain the 3D morphology of a cell and just really relatable examples uh, throughout. So what was that journey like? Um, I can start. I think uh, I relate a lot to what you're saying about maybe hiding behind big words or maybe not hiding is the right word, but like latching on to those terms and not understanding that if you spin it in a different way or you use an analogy that that actually can be more um, accessible and inclusive to the people that you're speaking to. So I think it was maybe more of a I just wanted to connect with the people in my life more about what I was doing. You know, I'm so excited about what I'm doing and I can chat with my lab friends about it and they understand. But when I talk to my parents or my brother and sister or friends, they have no idea what I'm talking about. And, and it's such an important part of my life. So trying to figure out how to sort of open those doors of conversation was something that I just started exploring. And also, I mean, I really like teaching. That's my whole job here. So um, that is a form of connection. So being able to find this way of explaining a concept so that someone understands and also connects with it is just personally satisfying. So I think I've gone on that journey because it's been rewarding for me. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's about finding that way to connect with the students and, and make it understandable because we do know that it can be a barrier. And so, you know, describing um, mucus molecule, for example, a glycoprotein as a sort of like a Christmas tree, and you know, if you're a you're a stain, and you're trying to stain the protein backbone of the, the stem of the Christmas tree, and you've got all these branches in in your face, you're not going to be able to reach that stem. And so that's why mucus doesn't stain well under H and E staining conditions for for microscopy. So sort of using analogies like that to um, make it just it makes sense, I guess. Um, uh, I, I love finding new analogies along the way um, and students when, you know, they go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, 
that's that's a really nice a nice feeling and you try to remember those and and things and it's funny too sometimes you get asked a question and you may not know the answer but then as you try to explain you come up with the answer like you just make and it makes sense it's a funny thing like you you sort of fake it until you make it almost um you sort of just yeah you chip away at it little bit by little bit and eventually you can come to the answer so um that's that's where where um that that communication becomes important i think you know not just saying you know um look it up or you know helping the students find the answers you help yourself find the answers as well oftentimes i love that jamie and um i think um you and i maybe do this like this improvisation in class trying to find the analogy So I'm going to put you on the spot. What's the most embarrassing analogy that you made in class that you you just kind of blurted it out and then you were like, can we just pretend that didn't happen? Okay. Can I, this is going to be a little bit rude. Is that okay? Um, So I was, I was, I was teaching uh, reproductive biology of people with testis and I was talking about the physiology of erection. Um, And so in the lecture, I was saying, okay, so getting onto erections. And then I realized what I had said. <laughs> and um, I said, no, I don't, I mean, yeah, moving on to discuss <laughs> erections. Um, so, yeah, I think you've got to, you can laugh. If you can't laugh at reproduction, I don't know where where you can laugh at. <laughs> Absolutely. Jenna, you had... Um something you wanted to throw in uh th- that was about uh the previous topic and now I feel like it's a hard <laughs> a hard turn back <laughs> but I, you know I, maybe it does connect because I was gonna say that um you know you sort of park your ego at the door when you want to try to engage with people about science beyond just talking to each other you know other scientists so I think it's just being willing to say something silly or, um, you know, not pick the most beautiful or correct uh, analogy and and people to see you make a mistake and you reason through it or correct it uh, or admit that. I think um, people hold scientists up, you know, at this really high pedestal until something happens and then they just get dropped completely down. So I think we need to have a bit more of a balanced view of scientists. You know, they're not the ultimate, uh, you know, pinnacle of truth, but, um, you know, it's about testing things and failing and, and trying again. So I think trying to emulate that in communication also works. Absolutely. And it, totally went well with Jamie's last comments because it's about being human right I could talk with the two of you for the next two hours and um, I want to thank you so much for your time with us Um, this was fascinating we covered a lot we covered cells tissues and the beauty of science communication with uh, two wonderful people in the field Um, thank you so much Shagan um, Absolutely. I share those sentiments and I have enjoyed this chat with Jamie and with you, Jenna. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, uh, That analogy about the uh, Christmas tree, glycoprotein side chains, I'm absolutely going to use it in my my histology lecture because I teach um, the synovial joints. I teach about the cartilage uh, matrix. So I'm going to use that, Jamie. So thank you. And uh, this has been really lovely. Thanks to both of you. Thanks thank you so very much, much for inviting us. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thanks so much. And this wraps up another episode of Body Banter. Looking forward to the next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>